unleash the hellhounds on protectors of white collar crime. Spirit of FDR looms over US crisis. Coming up on today's show. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 26th of November 2021. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party leader and founder Craig Isherwood. Welcome. Yeah, thanks Elisa. And on today's show we're going to be discussing the breakthroughs in the Sterling First case uh, which can force a shift for the entire economy and the role of government in a crisis. Say goodbye to don't do governments and mm. hello to FDR's approach. Uh, now don't forget if you like the show to hit the like button, uh, subscribe so you're notified of upcoming and new shows and you can hit the bell notification as well and share this as widely as possible and all those things help get the word out. Uh, now, before we start on the first topic of the day, we do have a reminder, and we talked about this on last week's show, uh, and that is that we need people to make a submission to the government's regional banking task force, uh, and that is due on the 18th of December. Now, we'll put a link in the um, info box below to the press release that we put out on this topic this week. Mm. And I want to give you a couple of the highlights of that release because it'll give you a sense of why we need this urgent intervention uh, and to direct the attention of that task force uh, to the necessity for a postal banking solution for Australia as a stepping stone to national banking. Um, so. These are some of the egregious things you can bring to their attention. Between 1975 and 2021, the number of bank branches in regional Australia collapsed by over 61 per cent, from 2,800 banks down to 1,080. And this is according to a very extensive study by independent journalist Dale Webster. And you can go to her website for more information. This trend has been accelerating. Uh, the task force discussions paper itself actually reported that the number of branches in regional and remote Australia has fallen from around 2,500 to 1,900 in the four years up until June 2021. That's a decline of almost a quarter with a 5% decline in branches over the past year alone. Now the banks have also ripped out about 20% of all ATMs nationwide since 2016 and that's also part of their war on cash. And they also note that there are 1,145 post offices providing bank at post services to regional and rural communities where there is no actual bank branch. Yeah, which is what we've experienced here in Coburg. You know, we have a population of you know, nearly a quarter of a million people around this area and our own local bank, you know, was shut down, as I reported on a few shows back, it just mm. shut doors. And, yeah. and everyone's, oh, go and do your banking at the post office. You know, I've also received notice that we aren't allowed now to deposit anything less than $500 in cash. Hmm. So if I've got $200 from supporters who sent it in in cash, I can't deposit that money in the account until hmm. it builds up to $500 because right. they are trying to stop people from using cash as well. Hmm. At least it, you know, the theme of our shows, of our party, is that we have to protect the public good. Banking services are not, they should not be dictated by private bank profits. And that's what you've got here. What we need to have is a bank, banking services that are there for and as a service. And reliable. Reliable, because mm. it's the backbone of the entire economy to have people have accessing their, their, their accounts and loans and everything like that. So the issue becomes, as Ben Shifley way back in the 30s pointed out, where you get private banks' profit margins dictating their policy, the public's always going to lose out. And that's why he tried to nationalise the banks Mm. at one point of time is yeah. because he said the, the issue of public credit of the public banking should be in the hands of the government, which is why we are very much promoting the need for a postal banking system and, of course, that gloves in with our national banking system. So people really do... This is a stepping stone, another one of the stepping stones towards getting that system into place and why we really do encourage people take up the uh, responsibility of putting a submission in. Mm. It might sound like a small thing, but, you know, a storm is only made up of a lot of raindrops. That's right. And that's what we want to create here is a, is a massive storm, again, to get these policies of public banking, postal and national banking in place. Yep. 
And that's very much the theme of today's entire show. So getting on to our first topic, unleash the hellhounds on protectors of white-collar crime. Now, the headline refers to Ferdinand Pecora and particularly the uh, title of this book by Michael Perino, which is a history of the what, what's known as the Pecora hearings that occurred in the United States in 1933. And this uh, was basically an investigation by the US Congress, and this particular committee, into the causes of the 1929 uh, financial crash which sparked the Great Depression. So it was of the utmost importance and what was interesting about these hearings is that um, we call them the Pecora hearings named after the chief counsel for the committee as opposed to the actual commissioner, the head of the mm. uh, commission or the chair of the commission, like we would say, for, for instance, the Hain Commission for our uh, financial services inquiry here. Um, because Pecora was this star in the entire proceeding, uh, it became known after him. And in fact, the hearings had dragged on for about a year with no discernible results of any interest. And in fact, the whole thing was just flagging off at the tail end when Pecora was brought in by some of the congressmen. And in 10 days, he completely turned around the whole thing, grilling these top uh, bankers from National City Bank to JP Morgan and so forth, put them on the stand and he had, he was not a banking expert, he was a lawyer, uh, but he also had a, a brilliant memory and he'd gone over books of the banks um, just, you know, on one occasion and yet he came in and grilled them on the stand and brought forward such a upsurge. There was already a hatred of the banks, obviously, but he actually nailed in concrete terms what they had done and that caused an absolutely explosive political situation. It inspired Roosevelt's line in his first inaugural address where he said the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization, and it led to the creation of a real financial architecture with regulations including Glass-Steagall regulations to prevent bank speculating, which is what they'd done that led to the crisis, the first federal securities laws, Federal Deposit Insurance and the Securities and Exchange Commission came into existence, all as a result of his interventions. Mm. Uh, now, I want to actually uh, take the time to actually read a little bit of the introduction to this book, and I highly recommend people read it. It's an excellent story. Um, uh, so this is what Michael Perino described in his introduction, which gives you the flavour of how this went. He said, Pecora had shown that the bank, being National City Bank, and its securities trading arm had engaged in all sorts of unsavoury behaviour. It sold worthless bonds to investors without fully disclosing their risks, manipulated its own stock price and the stock prices of other companies, and lavishly compensated its executives as the country plunged into depression. While the investigation continued to produce stunning revelations for months, including a dramatic confrontation between Pecora and J.P. Morgan Jr. later that spring, it was those 10 days that set the tone for everything that followed. It was then when banks across the country were shuttering, when Citibank's executives were in the dock and when Pecora led America through the bank's financial machinations that the federal government crossed its regulatory Rubicon. This was the turning point in which the relationship between Wall Street and Washington was forever altered. Those 10 days were a vivid sign that something fundamental had changed in the power structure of the country. This is the story of those 10 days. And the point I want to make is that the hearings we had last week already opened the door to such a process unfolding. You know, here we are two years after the final report of the Financial Services Royal Commission and none of Haynes' recommendations really essentially have been adopted. However, we haven't seen the final word on it. Mm. Something like this hearing and uh, the break, breaking news we have to announce is that uh, there's another hearing. They had two days of hearings last week. But la last night we heard uh, the great news that there is another hearing to be held sometime probably in the coming week. Uh, so there's more to come out of this. It could have mammoth implications for the country. Mm. Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, because we've had the Royal Commission, right, and... Uh, Haynes made very, very pointed recommendations about, for example, you know, looking at compensating a lot of uh, people who've lost money, you know, like the Sterling First victims. What, but the arrogance of the government is the key here. And this is something that uh, Pecora actually pointed out during his hearings, which really got people's 
backup because the then government, the Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon, uh, actually uh, inserted clauses into the Tax Act that meant that the bankers didn't pay any tax. So the entire house of J.P. Morgan bankers, mm. the, you imagine how wealthy these guys were, only paid five thousand dollars in taxes amongst the entire lot of them. So you had a system that was rigged by the political class in order to protect the bankers personally in this case, but there was also other you know, legislations and put into place so they could speculate, which caused the Great Depression. And at one point, you have to understand, when Franklin Roosevelt was coming in, 49, the, the, the banks in 49 of the 50 states were actually shut. Yeah. People have no access to their money whatsoever. So what Pecora did is he, he showed the, the absolute double standard and the criminality of these bankers towards the population as a whole. And that's what we're getting to in the Sterling First uh, hearings is where you're starting to see our regulators, you know, not just asleep at the switch, mm -hmm. but literally making sure that they've got that switch in the off position so yeah. there's no strong sh sh spotlight shone on the criminality of a lot of these financial, uh, you know, instruments and sectors and so forth that, uh, that are supposed to be regulating. Mm. And this is, this is what, uh, what we've brought to light, what the, these hearings have brought to yeah. light, is what we're actually dealing with. And this is the Morrison government protecting, again, the bankers. Yeah, exactly. And, and as you said, the system leaves no room for redress. And this is what uh, former ASIC investigator Niall Coburn raised last week in the hearings. And we played some uh, excerpts from those hearings last week and we're going to put together a standalone video to show some clips so there'll be more coming on that, which is really worth watching. Um, but I wanted to cite some more from Niall Coburn because he really blasted ASIC and, you know, he used to work for them. He was in the midst of it all. Um, now, of course, in, just to give a sense of the timeline, uh, in March 2017, ASIC had received a complaint from the Western Australian, Gover Western Australian Government Department uh, regarding Sterling First because uh, people had been basically sucked into this massive complicated investment scheme where they thought these elderly people thought they were just um, paying rent for life so that they were renting a home um, for the rest of their life they could downsize and so forth so ASIC, obviously WA was starting to get complaints about this but ASIC on the basis of this Western Australian Government Department complaint did not investigate uh, Coburn said in the hearings he would have acted immediately. He said, if you're waiting six months to a year, then you're going to have a lot of bodies in the street. And he said it was incredible that ASIC waited a year to investigate. He said if ASIC had investigated, uh, they would have immediately discovered that elderly victims, quote, had been sold a dog. It's not that complicated. Um, he then addressed ASIC's claims that this was relating to the property market, so it was not an investment, it was out of their jurisdiction. But as Coburn said, it had all the hallmarks of an investment product. He said, quote, you don't look at the cat, you look at the legs and the way it walks. What a fraudster does is to dress something up so that it looks good, unquote. So in other words, he said, you've got to look further. And he, he said, look, three days of investigation would have revealed the truth. That's all it would have taken. Now, uh, one of the things ASIC cited in its submission to this inquiry uh, was something that they stated after Storm Financial went bust and in response to that, um, that they acted, and this is their claim for the current quest, uh, trial at, at, um, at question, that ASIC acted as consistent with the economic philosophy underlying the financial sector reform regime. In other words, as Longo also expressed, we followed procedure. As Longo said at one point, that's how the system works. So, you know, they were co constantly saying, look, we played by the rules. The problem, of course, is the rules. And we'll come back to talk about that and where those rules came from in a moment. But Coburn responded this, to this really sharply. He said, whether you call it a model or whatever you call it, it's all the same thing. It's misleading and deceptive fraud, you know, to say that. Mm. That's it. So if someone tells you that we don't do it because it's the model or we don't interfere with the firm, that's not how it works. What works is what the investors are being told. You look at their complaints, you get the evidence, and if you need to kick in a door, then you kick in a door. <laughs> Uh, so, um, you know, he knows from the inside that this is how they operate and they're hiding behind the rules. 
Now, another important thing since last week's show, which is um, breaking news, is that um, you might remember that um, one of the things that the committee had demanded was that ASIC produce certain documents uh, that show how they handled the Sterling First case. So this was a Senate order for production of documents on 21st of October. Well, finally ASIC tabled those documents with much delay on Monday. And I want to mention some of those documents because they actually shed a really stunning light, further light on this whole picture. Um, so there was a complaint lodged in February 2015 by no less than the Financial Service Ombudsman and this, these documents show that ASIC decided not to take action despite receiving that February 2015 complaint and despite noting that Sterling had, quote, likely engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct. Now, then in June 2015, a report was lodged by an ASIC staffer regarding Sterling First advertising. That staffer was concerned that Sterling First may be providing an unlicensed um, financial advice and it may include possible misleading or deceptive conduct. Again, ASIC ignored it. Then in September 2016, an investor lodged a complaint with ASIC um, because they could not withdraw funds that they'd invested in one of the Sterling First uh, companies. ASIC again did not investigate until after, much after, the Western Australian Government Department complaint. And this is, this is incredible, Elisa, because back in 2015, we'd just published a new citizen back then talking about the danger of the financial bubbles created through derivatives. We weren't giving financial advice, but we were describing the political, the international political nature of these, these terrible instruments called derivatives, which are basically speculative and warning people about it. It was this branch of ASIC wrote to us and warned us and threatened us as directors of the, the, the publishing company, that we had no, we, we, that we were possibly overstepping our boundaries mm. in publishing this new citizen. Now, of course, it was a political. Uh, one, someone had complained to ASIC at that point and said, "Oh, these guys are giving a financial advice." We were not. We were commenting politically on the nature of the danger of the financial system, mm. which then, you know, crashed. Yep. Um, now this goes back to, nine, uh, to, to about two thousand. I think it was two thousand and six, mm. right before the actual global financial crisis, but this ASIC back then was going to come after us, but they didn't do this with you know, fun, uh, Sterling First No, or they ignored everything. Everything, but delayed. they came after us. Exactly. So, you know, the model is what it is. It's to protect white collar criminals and even beyond. So it's that model that has to be changed. Um, but these, this additional hearing that's taking place next week um, was partly in response to this production of documents because everyone that saw these documents, including um, the victims, the senators, everyone involved, realised that the content of these documents was explosive. So there has to be a response from ASIC. They have to be put back on the stand to answer for the fact that they did nothing. Um, so that's going to be you know, very, very interesting to watch. So stay tuned on that front. Now on this topic, I also want to um, mention uh, an excellent video up on our YouTube channel right now, and this is the latest in our Citizens Insights series. Uh, this is an interview Robert Barwick has done with Peter Johnston, the Executive Director of the Association of Independently Owned Financial Planners. It's called Nobody is Safe in the Financial System Unless the Government Writes This Wrong. And this is in reference to something we talked about last week, which is the fact that as he's pulled together from numerous of the Sterling First type operations, um, there's plenty of them, there's a long list. Um, 200,000 Australians have lost in the order of $40 billion. billion. Um, so this is um, something that people should watch and it really um, intersects this whole fight in a brilliant way because there's a lot of other groups that are fighting on this. And boy, if we could find those 200,000 oh, yeah. um, Australians, I mean, obviously we've got a lot of oh, them already in, in our ranks. But, but it's, it's staggering, Elisa, when you look at the list of firms that have given out faulty financial instruments is absolutely staggering. You, know, you don't, you don't realise that the, the, the depth of this corruption is so deep. Yeah. I mean, the fact is ASIC's been asleep, and it proves that ASIC's been asleep. That's right, and this is just one aspect of how, you know, we've been done over. 
Um, but now I want to talk about a bit more extensively about this model that Joe Longo, um, the business friendly, the new business friendly head of ASIC, is touting as his defence. Um, because, of course, Niall Coben said deferring to that model is not a sufficient defence. And it, it's that model, of course, which has to be up for discussion and has to be changed uh, and fast, especially as we're facing a new global financial crisis. Well, really, it's the same old one because it didn't finish in 2008. That was really just the beginning. Um, and look, this model is identical to Scott Morrison's uh, notion that he's been putting out just lately, uh, which he calls can-do capitalism, <laughs> which essentially is leave the market to its own um, devices, don't allow governments to interfere with any kinds of interventions, particularly regulations. And he made this speech at the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry on the 10th of November. Um, he literally said we must put, quote, animal spirits of enterprise, unquote, over in the interventionist uh, laws and regulations that governments put forward. So, you know, he talks this idea of freedom for Australians, or we've got to give people back their freedoms after these last two years of a pandemic and so forth and what was required there. But all the time he knows we're operating, every Australian operates within the straight jacket of an economic system that was scripted by neoliberal think tanks, and this goes back to the Campbell Committee and the Wallace Inquiry, which created the entire economic framework, completely deregulated, which allows ASIC to follow this so-called model, which allows people to be ripped off. Um, well, it's worse than that, Lisa. When we talk about neoliberal, some of our viewers may not, may not understand why that is. Well, let me just give a very quick snapshot here. Neoliberalism is based upon the old slave trading, dope or drug trading models of the British East India Company. That's where this came from. Yeah. When you go back into history, you look at the whole issue of slavery and of drug trades and so forth. It comes back to the British Crown. It comes back to the British East India Company. And this philosophy is free market, uh, deregulation, anything goes, mm -hmm. right? And that's you know, the law of the jungle, uh, which is what Scott Morrison is talking about here, animal spirits of enterprise. Well, I call that effectively law of the jungle. Well, exactly. And this is neoliberalism. It's this is what so it is. so that the big players can dominate and, and rig the game. And it means that the neoliberalism means small government. Government should not interfere in anything. You know, don't have control over the banking system. Don't have control over trade. Don't have policies that establish manufacturing. Leave the law of the jungle, mm. figure it out. The magic of the mar marketplace. And, you know, this is the philosophy that has ruined this country for the last 40 years because the power of government to direct credit mm. for actually developing infrastructure and manufacturing and the physical economy that we need to develop our nation, mm. oh, you yeah, can't have that. Government intervention is bad. So... You know, we've got a lot of history and, and we've talked about it on this program and we've done videos on it about how John Curtin and, and um, Ben Chifley, for example, used the power of government yep. by, and the Commonwealth Bank to regulate the economy and provide credit into the economy and we actually had the ability to defend ourselves in World War II. That's a whole history of, and a successful history of our country where the role of government through real leadership was able to transform the physical economy. And ever since then, we've been on a downward slide, mm -hmm. accelerated in the last 40 years by the open adoption of these neoliberal policies through think tanks like initially the Mont Pelerin Society, which we've written a lot about. But those think tanks come through the Centre for Independent Studies, the, uh, the IPA. There's a whole raft of these things that were set up in the late 70s mm. that dictate these sorts of policies that have actually taken over government on both sides. Yep. So we represent... The Citizens Party represents a different polarity of actual real development of government-directed development mm -hmm. uh, in order to deal with, uh, you know, not just repairing but actually expanding our economy. Yeah, and this financial sector reform that was cited by ASIC, um, this came from the Campbell Committee, which was the 1981 inquiry into our financial system, um, headed by... Um, Campbell, who was the chairman of City National Bank, uh, which was a merger between National Mutual, the Australian insurance company, with Bank of New York, and 
uh, which I might add finance Christopher Scase's first takeover. So the beginning of the white collar crime and the paradise we've become for it. Um, but the Campbell Committee uh, put forward this notion that all financial uh, activity should be regulated by the efficient markets theory, which is exactly this free market law of the jungle that we've been uh, talking about. And um, what I wanted to point out is that John Hewson was the chief architect of this inquiry. Uh, he recruited the co-founder of the Mont Pelerin Society that you were talking about, Milton Friedman. He was the co-founder along with um, Friedrich von Hayek. So Milton Friedman was an outside advisor to the inquiry. He was in Australia at the time. Uh, he'd first come to Australia in 1975 at the invitation of Morris Newman, who was later the head of the Australian Stock Exchange and chairman of the Centre for Independent Studies, which was a, a think tank founded by the Mont Pelerin Society. And so the Mont Pelerin Society basically set up think tanks across the globe to influence economic policy, as we've documented. Now, what was interesting, though, at that time uh, is that Malcolm Fraser, Fraser gave um, Milton Friedman, they did meet, mm -hmm. but Fraser gave Friedman absolutely the cold shoulder and he ended up binning most of the recommendations of the Campbell inquiry. Um, however, that was turned around and in Morris Newman's words, it was done through the Hawke government and a supportive John Howard-led opposition. In other words, this was the beginning of what we now refer to as the bipartisan economic consensus. So when Labor came into government, it implemented the lot of the Campbell recommendations rebadged as the Martin Inquiry Review of Campbell. Uh, and the Campbell reforms were hailed literally as a triumph of Friedman's policies. So, yeah. you know, this is what we're dealing with. Yeah, we've, you know, we've covered this a lot in some of our publications, at least on this, the, the depth of the infiltration by this ideologi ideologically driven mm. intent of the takedown of government and the role of government. Yeah. You know, we've seen the privatisation of state assets and the wholesale sell-off, like with the Kennett government here. We've seen the takedown of the healthcare system, right? You've seen the privatisation in so many different industries and also this idea of the comparative advantage. You don't develop industries in Australia because our comparative advantage is to dig out iron ore and ship it off overseas. And or buy other stuff buy, cheaper. Buy stuff cheaper, right? Well, that works all fine until you get to a pandemic and your supply lines are mm. cracking up like they are now. And see, this is the whole policy direction, which is both parties. Mm. Yep. It wasn't the, 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 the idea of John Curtin and, and Ben Chifley. It wasn't the idea of old Labor. But unfortunately, this... Uh, this ideology has now infected, as you've pointed out from the well, Hawke both government, parties, yeah. both parties, and it's destroyed our economy. And this whole Morrison salvo about can-do capitalism, look, he's he's just trying to sell us the same pup we already had, <laughs> because this is it's what we had. an old dog, actually, not a new, not a new <laughs> yeah, pup. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we want to move on to our next topic, which is related. Spirit of FDR looms over US crisis. Um, because there's an interesting um, element building in the US right now. Uh, now, this is, I want to say up front, this is not an endorsement of what Biden's doing. He's not doing anywhere near enough of what he should be doing. Um, but the crisis that's bearing down on the US, as with other countries, is invoking pertinent historical examples that can't be ignored. So there's a lot of talk about Franklin Roosevelt and the little tiny bit that Biden is doing in terms of government spending and, of course, you know, all the talk right now is, oh, governments shouldn't be spending rah, rah, rah. Um, but the little bit that he is doing is he's copying flack for mm -hmm. um, in this era of don't do government. Um, so there's a number of infrastructure initiatives, for instance. Um, one has passed through already the House and the uh, Senate, which has already got bipartisan support. Um, we've written about that in the Australian Alert Service, which you can find out more about by getting a sample copy from us or subscribing if you haven't. Uh, there's another piece of legislation that's passed the House but is now facing the Senate and a further one which is a, a larger amount of money being held up by negotiations. So and none of these, I should say, are sufficient. We really need, the US really needs to go back to national banking mm -hmm. through the national infrastructure bank that's on the table over there and which is getting a lot of support. I should also add postal banking legislation is on the table currently in the US. So they're looking at similar ideas. But I just want to show how this came to a head uh, just recently. I want to show a short clip here 
uh, from House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Now, he's a Republican, but he quotes a Democratic uh, Congresswoman, Representative Abigail, Abigail Spanberger. So we'll just play that. Just a few weeks ago, Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger said, nobody elected Joe Biden to be FDR. This even spends more than FDR while he was fighting a world war. Now, um, so he's quoting the Democrat and obviously endorsing her sentiment, saying, oh, we didn't elect Biden to be an FDR. Um, now, the White House responded to this. One of the advisers, Cedric Richmond, stated that when he was asked, he said, Biden was elected to do big things, including infrastructure. He said, if you want to describe it as FDR-like, he said, then it's FDR-like. Uh, but then what was interesting is that um, there was a, an op opinion editorial that came out in The Hill, which is the, one of the major papers there in Washington, D.C., written by the grandkids of uh, Roosevelt and his vice president and others. It was put together by James Roosevelt, Jr., the grandson of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, Henry Scott Wallace, the grandson of Henry A. Wallace, FDR's Vice President and Secretary of Agriculture and Commerce, and a great guy who we've also written a lot about. June Hopkins, the granddaughter of Harry Hopkins, FDR's close advisor and architect of the New Deal. And Tomlin Perkins Coggeshall, who's the grandson of Francis Perkins, FDR's Labor Secretary. And these people are all professionals or professors, etc. And in this um, article, they say that we're in a New Deal moment. Um, they say the four of us are grandchildren of FDR, his vice president, and two cabinet members who were highly involved in crafting the New Deal. We think it couldn't be clearer. Spanberger is wrong and Richmond is right. Meaning, you know, we did elect Biden to be mm -hmm. FDR. That's exactly what we want. Uh, it went on to say Biden was elected to emulate FDR. Biden talked about him constantly during the campaign. Days before the election, he gave an entire speech devoted to FDR's example. And, you know, I know there were a, a number of references that he did make to FDR, albeit nowhere in near enough. He could yeah. be emulating him a lot more. Um, however, it is extremely interesting that we find ourselves in this situation where, just like you were talking about Chifley and Curtin, you know, th this is the same spirit in the US that you governments don't have to be don't do governments. No, well, that's right. I mean, this is why the neoliberals hate FDR. It's because FDR was faced with a crisis. He had 49 out of the 50 banks, uh, banks, sorry, 49, 49 of the, uh, out of the 50 states, the banks were closed. He had millions upon millions of people starving, literally, literally starving, right? You had a, a complete shutdown of the economy, so he had to act. Now, there's similarity to, to what the United States is facing with the pandemic with so many deaths and everything over there and the takedown of the economy over the last 40 years. So Biden's come in with an idea of infrastructure and any hint of a government taking control of, of the economy is despised by these neoliberals. Now, what, what did FDR do? I mean, he had a multifaceted approach to the economy. He had to deal with banking and credit to start with, to deal with the banking system infrastructure building white to put people back into work and to deal with all sorts of things. Public works employment was the quickest way to put people into work. So he had millions of people put into work in a matter of days. Um, and you could, you know, uh, I think it was Wallace, for example, um, and Hopkins were the key guys that were putting, they literally set up, you know, instantaneous offices in the White House and had people, millions of people back to work within the space of a week or 10 days. Yeah by deploying the power of the government to get people employed. They had to look at different social justice programs to make sure there was, uh, people could, you know, pensions and so forth could be provided yeah. to people who had no income. And they, of course, then provided many other types of different um, uh, reforms at that particular time. Now, I mean, if you have a look, for example, just at some of the public works employment, like, for example, the location of some of the public works uh, Association hydroelectric dam projects in the 1930s. They started building dams everywhere. You have a look at the power projects because a lot of the areas of the United States had no power. They, were, you know, they had the whole rural electrification scheme under the New Deal. So they had to build more power projects. You had uh, schools was another one, but uh, 
They the, looked at the things that were lacking in the economy, where most politicians see that, oh, we've got this problem, X, Y, Z, they're all problems. Yeah. He, Roosevelt looked at it differently. He said, these problems provide a solution for us to put people back to work, to do something. That building is going to grow the economy. Yep. And, you know, they built tens of thousands of hospitals. Oh, sorry, you know, you know, and, you know th thousands, tens of thousands of sanitation. You know, this is not the sexy stuff. Talking about sewerage systems is not sexy, yeah. Elisa, but it's important it's for the economy. not election worthy. <laughs> no, it's not election worthy. You had, this is you not know, exactly what we need to be doing across thousands, this country. Tens of thousands of water projects, right? Mm -hmm. This is what he did. And, of, and, you know, thousands of schools, like I said before, in order to get the economy moving again, getting people employed, building real infra infrastructure. And this freaked the hell out of the neoliberals because it worked. Mm. It created an enormous degree of optimism because people were seeing that their government was acting in the interest of the common good for their general welfare, and it worked. And that meant that mm. you know, the little neoliberal model was actually dead for many years until unfortunately Roosevelt died prematurely, in my view, mm. uh, and the, you know, the, the thing was slowly unwound mm. from that point. And interestingly enough, because there was collaboration with other countries going on, and just to mention one thing which is kind of striking in today's context, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority building all these grand hydroelectric projects, they sent people to China to advise China on how to build the Three Gorges Dam, which didn't happen until much later. Um, but they did the surveying and laid out what the projects could be. So you, And mm. the Chinese were going over there. So you had this kind of um, framework of every country needed to develop and a rising tide lifts all boats and that's mm. exactly what we need to get back uh, to again today. And, you know, Professor Lance Endersby, for example, spent some time in the United States working or looking at these particular projects and then came back and worked on the Snowy Mountain Scheme. So these, yeah. this initiated a whole raft of, you know, very exciting projects, particularly in our own country, mm. the Snowy being one of them. Uh, we also had the development of hydroelectricity in Tasmania. All sorts of things came out of this project from FDR, which, of course, today is all frowned upon. Hmm. So, um, you know, there's plenty more about this. Look in the info box below. You'll see how you can contact us to get a free copy of the alert service. There's also some articles we'll link that you can read more about these particular subjects because we uh, never have time to go no, through it in no. all the necessary detail. And we do need to be educating not just the population, but, you know, you need to take these ideas and educate your Member of Parliament and be in contact with them on a regular basis because this is how you actually change the face of government and change politics, mm. as we've shown in numerous examples and victories we've had in campaigns recently. Yeah. Um, and on that note, don't forget to like, share and uh, subscribe to the channel. That will help get the word out further. Um, that's all we've got time mm. for this week. Thanks, Again. Craig. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you again next week.